Good morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall and Writer's Block in a partnered program today. We are pleased to bring another live stream discussion together as partners. Today's presentation is on crisis leadership, meeting the populist challenge. We are honored to welcome Gray Davis, the 37th governor of California and moderator, Jim Newton, biographer of former California governor, Jerry Brown. Since last spring, we have collaborated on several distinguished speakers and thought leaders. We look forward to today's timely and important discussion. Now it's my very great pleasure to introduce Andrea Grossman, founder and president of Writer's Block, who will introduce Governor Davis and Jim Newton. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Kim. First, there was the coronavirus. Now there's a recall fever. As you know, Governor Newsom isn't the only elected official whose neck is on the recall line. Recalls are surging in California. According to the LA Times, 68 recall efforts have been undertaken in California in just the past six months, since January. Electeds from school boards, district attorneys, council members, county supervisors, you name it. And unlike Governor Newsom, they weren't seen unmasked during the height of the lockdown having dinner at a destination restaurant. Is this partisan? Why are voters so angry now? Is it easier to pull electeds from power than it was before? Here today are two people who have been in and observed the political trenches for decades. Jim Newton is an award-winning journalist and the author of Man of Tomorrow, a most magnificent biography of former Jer Governor Jerry Brown. He served for 25 years at the LA Times and with his staff, took home a few Pulitzers. He did time as a reporter, bureau chief, columnist, and op-ed page editor from 2007 to 2010. He teaches public policy now at the Luskin School of Public, of public Affairs at UCLA. Former Governor Davis was considered to be one of the most highly qualified governors to hit Sacramento, following stints in the assembly as controller of California, as lieutenant governor, and so much more. He was elected to the governorship in 1998. In 2003, after the electricity crisis and other political tsunamis, Arnold Schwarzenegger and 134 other candidates vied for his office. I can think of no individual more qualified than former Governor Davis and no one more qualified than Jim Newton to discuss this recall movement now underway in California. Please submit your questions to Governor Davis on the right-hand side of your screen. Jessica Degancic, VP of Events for the LA World Affairs Council will help facilitate the Q&A in about 30 minutes. I'm so honored to present former Governor Gray Davis and Jim Newton. Hello, everyone. Uh, I guess we're on. Uh, can I hear you, Governor? Yes, I'm, I'm with you. I actually Wonderful. appeared a little earlier than I'm supposed to, but <laughs> well, you know, Val. You beat me to the punch, but not for the first time. Uh, listen, first of all, I want to just thank you, Governor. Uh, it's always a pleasure and honor to be with you, uh, and I'm delighted that you were able to make the time to do this today. So thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure. Uh, let's start. Uh, the title of today's talk refers to the populist challenge. Um, and obviously, populism is a force to be reckoned with in American politics uh, today. Um, but not all uh, campaigns are populist. And I, so I guess I want to turn to the Newsom uh, recall in just a moment. But let's start with yours. Um, did you view the challenge against you as a, as a populist movement? What, 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 how would you characterize the recall campaign against you in 2003? Well, um, first of all, let me thank uh, Kim and uh, Aunt Andrea and Jessica who helped me through the vagaries of my uh, my limited knowledge on how to use WebEx. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to be with you, Jim. I, we go, go back many years. So in response to your question, something that people need to understand is recalls start initially because political consultants generally don't get paid in odd numbered years because there's no statewide election in an odd numbered year unless they qualify a recall or some other special election in which case they can have another gig uh, and presumably one in 2022. So once they file the papers uh, in California, it's relatively easy to do that. Um, then they then they go out and try and find people who are uh, in a period of discontent. 
In my day, that was not too hard to do. We were in the midst of a national recession. We did have the energy crisis, which I'm sure we'll get into. Um, in the governor's day, we have a pan Governor Newsom, we have a pandemic that's affected every person on the planet Earth. In a way, his pandemic is easier to explain than mine. In my case, uh, we didn't know it at the time, but Enron was a criminal enterprise. Their CEO went to prison, was sentenced for 24 years. Their chairman, former CEO, was convicted by a jury, mysteriously died after that. Their CFO went to prison for seven years. About eight other people pled guilty. And seven months after a video, which I'll describe in a moment, uh, was made public, the company ceased to exist. The video had Enron ordering a blackout in San Francisco. Uh, turned out they ordered many blackouts. We didn't know that while I was governor, uh, but it was a very difficult thing to explain to ratepayers. Um, this is my last statement that's in the weeds. Ratepayers were, were barred under a new law before I became governor. Uh, their rates couldn't go up, even though utilities were paying a thousand and two thousand dollars for megawatts of power that they used to pay thirty-five dollars for a year or two earlier. So, one utility was in bankruptcy, another on the verge. Very difficult for me to explain that to people. Very easy for Governor Newsom. So initially, the recall starts because political consultants, insiders, want to get paid, but that. They won't get the signatures unless there are people out there who are upset over something, and then they try to fan the flames of that, and then that can grow it into a large populist movement. Wow. Do you recall when you first heard that there was a, a, a recall effort being mounted against you, and did you take it seriously at first? Uh, yes, I do recall. Uh, just to put it in context, I think Ronald Reagan had like six attempts uh, to recall him, none of them ever amounted to anything. I remember once his lieutenant governor, I won't tell you who it is, but some Democratic activist said uh, to me that we're gonna plan a recall against the governor. We wanna list your name as a candidate to replace him. I said, no, I don't want anything part to do with that. If I run for governor someday, I just wanna run straight up in a normal election. Um, so I heard about the recall shortly after I was reelected in 2002. Um, I got sworn in in January, I think the first week, and by the third week, I heard that people were talking about a recall in the Capitol. So, I mean, I could hardly uh, do any damage between the time that I was uh, reelected and took the oath of office. And so I viewed it largely as just another bite at the apple. And for a long time, it looked like they wouldn't get the necessary signatures. Uh, I can go into more details if you want. But initially, these recalls all start because political consultants want to get paid, but they're only successful if there is a ground groundswell that follows follows them along and signs the signatures, I mean, and signs the necessary signatures to qualify the initiative. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to suppose that there's always enough people out there to sign signatures to qualify a recall. There's always enough people who voted against the governor to be able to muster the signatures required to recall a governor, right? So that doesn't seem like a very formidable challenge. Uh, it's, it, it, your point is getting truer by the day because with the advent of the internet, well, let me back up. Hiram Johnson is the author of populism in California. He was a California governor having difficulty working with the legislature because the railroads in his judgment had too much power. So he, he campaigned for three initiatives, all of which passed in 1911, 110 years ago. So California was an early adopter of populism. The voters had then had the first and last word. They could vote to recall a public official. They could rescind the legislation they passed, or they could write their own legislation, get signatures, put it on the ballot. If it passes, it becomes law. So uh, the seeds of that were over 100 years old. And I tell people who are running for office and complain about that, hey, look, this is the way it is in California. If you don't like it, run for office in some other state. Because you know we've given the, the power to the people for over a hundred years, and they're not about to let to let it go. Mm -hmm. Do you? You mentioned the energy crisis, and I'd like to come uh, talk a little bit more about that. Um, in the absence of that energy crisis, do you think you would have weathered uh, the recall effort? We got forty-five percent of the vote. Uh, in the recall, question one requires the governor to get fifty percent. Question one is: uh, Should Governor Newsom, in this case, Governor Davis, in my case, be retained in office. You have to get 50% of the vote. You can get 49% of the vote and you can lose. You can also get more votes than anyone else who's running on question two, which is moot if the governor gets to 50%. But 
but it's operative if he does. So Governor uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger did get 51% of the vote. However, the second place candidate, Lieutenant Governor Bustamani, only got 31. So all he needed was 32, 33% of the vote. And it's theoretically possible on any recall that the winning candidate will actually get less votes on the same ballot that the governor's on. And that's something I think reformers should take a look at. My own view is fine. If there's going to be a recall, put everyone on the ballot, uh, the governor, everyone else, whoever wins, wins. Yeah, listen, you're skipping to what I what I was going to conclude with, but let's go to that now, because this is, I must admit, my biggest frustration with the structure of the recall, and that we are in a situation now with Governor Newsom, where Governor Newsom could get 49%, and John Cox, or heaven forbid, uh, Caitlyn Jenner, uh, could get, you know, 15 or 16%. And so three, four times as many Californians might want Governor Newsom to stay in office, and he still might lose that office to a much less popular candidate. That seems beyond uh, problematic and into the area of just defective uh, in terms of the structure of the way the recall set. Uh, I mean, I, I suspect I'm preaching to the choir when it comes to you, but um, but th there's just been something profoundly wrong with that. <clears throat> yeah, and, I, and I, that's why I do think the reformers ought to take a look at that, because it, what the recall really guarantees to the public is there is another election, and that's an election uh, that's, you know, un uncalled for, unscheduled, um, and so it's obviously disruptive, and I think there should be an election. But just put all the candidates on the same ballot, uh, tally up the votes, and whoever wins is the governor for re the remainder of that term. Now, as it turns out, Governor Newsom is up for election next year on a regular basis. There'll be a, a vote in June, and the top two candidates in June, whatever party they may be, will be the candidates that are on the ballot next November. So whoever wins this election is only governor for a year, assuming the uh, election takes place sometime this fall, the special election. I mean, is there any doubt in your mind that Governor Newsom would beat any of the so uh, announced candidates so far head to head? Uh, no doubt whatsoever. I've been saying that, as you know, for the last six or seven months, the time is on his side. Uh, we have uh, set the world's record, uh, save for five other nations. Uh, in the terms of inoculations, which is the, the name of the game, without two vaccines created in less than a year, which is a modern miracle. The previous record was four years. Another in a year, uh, we would be in a world of hurt. We've lost 600,000 uh, Americans. Uh, that number could easily have gone up to three or four times that amount if we didn't have these vaccines. So goal number one is to get shots in arms. We've administered 40 million, more than all but five nations on the planet Earth. Plus, we have the lowest positivity rate, meaning t people testing positive, except for two other states. The death rate, we rank about 30th, meaning 29 states have a worse uh, uh, record per capita than we do. So any way you look at it, he's done a pretty good job. So as time passes, more and more people will feel better about the fact that we're likely coming out of this pandemic. Schools will be opening in the fall. Businesses are already starting to be open and people will start feeling better about themselves and their future. When people feel better about themselves, they vote for incumbents, meaning Governor Newsom. So the time is on his side. I have no doubt that he's going to win, but I wanted to indicate in some detail why. And then there's some other reason if you want to get into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I'd like to go back to your recall uh, for a moment, uh, just before moving completely into Newsom's. Um, one of the strategic efforts that was underway, I recall well, and you recall even better than me, of course, uh, was to try to hold ranks among Democrats. Uh, Dianne Feinstein decided not to run, Leon Panetta, others. Uh, but Bustamante, Cruz Bustamante, broke ranks uh, and did put his name on the ballot. How significant was that? Uh, I want to ask you in a moment whether you think any Democrat will do that in this campaign. But for the moment, just about your campaign, how, how disruptive was that to your attempt to hold on to office? I, I definitely played a part. Uh, he got 31% of the vote. And even though he was saying publicly, and I, I give, I believe he was sincere, uh, that you should vote no on the recall, but vote yes on business to money, uh, some polling suggests that a lot of people really wanted uh, there to be the first uh, uh, Hispanic uh, lieutenant governor and voted yes on the recall and, and yes on Bush money. So definitely would have gotten closer to that 50%. And as I said before, if we had that video of Enron creating a blackout in San Francisco, 
four days after we were all in a meeting and at the meeting uh which was in the secretary of state's office back in washington all the energy companies enron Energy, reliant were saying you have to raise rates and by raising rates they meant raising it from 35 dollars to a thousand or two thousand that means raising rates six or seven times not six or seven percent, six hundred or seven hundred. And we had two Republicans and two Democrats and myself, and we all said, we're not doing that to the ratepayers. Uh, energy deregulation was your idea, energy companies, not the ratepayers. We're not going to punish them. Four days later, the lights went out in San Francisco. That was clearly a shot across the bow, but we did not know them at the time. So if I had that video and Cruz Bustamante didn't win, I'm quite confident that we, we would have won the recall. Last question about your recall, and this is one I've always meant to ask you about, or observe, uh, and so now's the opportunity. I want to give a sh shout out, if I may, to Diane Feinstein. She was just a fantastic campaigner for me. We, we basically let her run the campaign and do what, say what she wanted. She did some commercials for us, but she had been the subject of a recall as mayor of San Francisco, and she knew how difficult that was. And so, um, you know, I was polling in the mid-20s, but we got 45% of the vote, and I give a lot of that and needed 50, that gave a lot of that credit to her. Yeah. Um, as I started to say, I've, I've always wanted to ask you, or always wanted to get your thoughts. I, I, I marvel at the equanimity uh, with which you have uh, absorbed this recall over the years. I mean, I've seen city council candidates more freaked out to lose a race uh, than you have been in the aftermath of the recall. I, I wonder just how how you absorbed it and, and what it felt like and, and how it is that you seem so even keeled about it after all these years. Um, I am, I guess I'm a fatalist, um, but I believe in life there are good breaks and bad breaks, and you just have to deal with each of them. I remember giving a speech at Columbia Law School, and I said, because uh, I graduated from there, and I said, uh, it was a very long day, and uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was there for her 15th anniversary, and everybody was giving speeches about her, and I had a few remarks praising her. So I said to the students, I know it's getting a long day, I'm going to give you a three sentence summary of my speech. School is fair. Life is not. Just <laughs> deal with it. Now, early on, and I made the point that they'll get good breaks and don't get too cocky and think how smart you are, and they'll get bad breaks and don't get too upset because life will even things up. So in the early part of my camp campaign for governor, I was like in fourth place. It was an open primary, so the Republican the candidate attorney general was counted in those four. Um, and all my friends said, well, you know, you're the best qualified, but you're never going to get elected. So one of my opponents, Al Checky, was upset that Congresswoman Jane Harmon had criticized him in the newspaper. So instead of responding in kind, he, he goes on television for five months, I mean, five <laughs> weeks, starting in January, the, the uh, primaries in June. And he, he starts off the campaign with the best picture ever taken of me, saying, I'm running against two political pros. Lieutenant Governor Gray Davis and Congressman Jane Harmon. Nobody else had a dime on television. On the strength of Al Checky's commercial, I went from last to first. And then I told all my supporters, look, I'm in first place. I haven't even started yet. So then I raised raise money and we, we, we won by 20 points. But without that commercial, I probably would not have been uh, governor and able to do some of the positive things we did. So I got good breaks going in. I was always kind of humble about that and every time my campaign manager was terrific, Gary South, and my consultants were kind of crawling about how good they are, and they are. And I said, look, none of you thought of this Al Checky commercial for five weeks, and I'm telling you, nothing moved the needle, needle like that commercial. So that got me in the office. Uh, things worked to get me uh, out of the office. But you, you, that's all you can do with life is just, you know, go on with your life, find other ways to serve the public. My wife so enjoys retirement she said if she knew life would be so good after the recall she would have campaigned for it <laughs> she's behind it after all <laughs> she was against it then but she's for it now <laughs> all right well let's all right so let's move to the newsom thank you uh let's move to newsom's uh, situation um you know this has become sort of a referendum on his handling of covid but it actually began prior to COVID, uh, really, in, as was the case in your case, almost as soon as he took office. Um, what do you think, I mean, you've already uh, talked about the consultant incentive here, but beyond that, what are the motives, the, in your view, what are the motives uh, behind this the, the attempt to recall Governor Newsom? 
uh, assuming that the that it really isn't generated by COVID, because just chronologically, it's not generated by the reaction to COVID. What's what do you think is really behind this? I think it's an easier way for people to get elected uh, to any office, including governor. First of all, we don't even know when the election will be held, but we do know that it's likely to be held in the next 100 to 120 days. And yet, there's no official campaigning yet, um, and there won't be really until the Secretary of State certifies that uh, the cost of the election have been determined. Then the Lieutenant Governor decides when it will be, and she will decide, uh, it has to be between 60 and 80 days after the Secretary of State said, okay, we have all the signatures, which she's already said today, and we know what the costs are, you can call the election Lieutenant Governor. So uh, 80 days is the out longest it could be from when the Secretary of State certifies, and my guess is that will be in the next month or so, and yet there's no campaigning, we're not even talking about it. So it's a very short election, it's only one election, you don't have to go through a primary, typically in a primary, Democrats uh, get selected from the kind of left side, of, uh, the, the, not always the farthest left, but frequently the farthest left candidate. Same thing on the right side with the Republicans. This way, a centrist can win uh, in a very short election. So, and the vetting process is very short. At best, there's 100 days for editorial writers, various interest groups to weigh in. Before you have a primary in June, a general election in November, and people will start queuing up for that governor's race, you know, the day after the, uh, the recall in the fall, whereas this election will be like 100, 110 days at most. So very short, no primary, um, much less vetting publicly and by various interest groups, and much less known about the candidates uh, than would be a case in a traditional election. So my view it should only be used for extraordinary circumstances. Yeah, you know, I was uh, looking up just in preparation for today, and you know, California does, under Article Two of the Constitution, have a provision uh, for impeachment. Uh, two thirds of the Assembly can vote to impeach. Two thirds of the Senate can vote to remove. It is for misconduct. Um, I noted, uh, interestingly, that the Senate can disqualify an official from any office of honor, trust, or profit uh, ever again if they're impeached. That is a removal process, which in many ways parallel to the federal system. Um, why isn't that enough? Uh, why do we need both an impeachment process and a recall process? Would uh, would just an, the availability of impeachment not be enough to hold politicians in check against misconduct, for instance? Well, let me tell you a lesson I learned the hard way. Uh, once uh, the state has given something to the public, it's impossible to take it back. The, the site, chapter, and verse. So in my last... Uh, we had a big surplus my first year in, in 1999, and an even bigger one in 2000. In my day, the legislature, to pass a budget without a tax increase, without a tax increase, still had to get a two-thirds vote. Only two other states required that. But So there was always a price to get, in this case, the Republican votes. Uh, and they wanted, each year, to reduce the car tax, which is really the registration fee. So bottom line, my first, second, third, and fourth year, we kept reducing the fees that people paid for their car when they registered their car every year. The fifth year, we were out of money. Uh, the, the, Demo the Republicans would not vote for a tax increase, so the only way I could raise some money was to raise the car tax back to where it was when I first took office. And I said to people, I know you're not going to like this, but you've had four years of increasingly lower payments, and this year we're out of money. They said, man, we didn't ask you to lower the taxes, but you lower the taxes, and we're not giving it back to you. So you asked the public to give up their power to uh, recall an elected official, uh, repeal uh, uh, passage of a law, or uh, the ability to write a law themselves through the initiative process. They're going to say no. Yeah. And it's not even a close. That would be like an 80% vote. Uh, I'm just going to pause for a moment uh, just to remind uh, all of you in our audience that we're going to turn to you in just a minute uh, for your questions. So please uh, submit them to Jessica and we'll turn it over to her in just a couple minutes. But I have a few more for you before I let you go, Governor. Um, Newsom, uh, over the next whatever it is, 100, 120, 150 days, however, whatever the span is between now and the election, is, of course, going to be to some degree at the mercy of events. Um, uh, 
how if we were to have a sudden surge in the virus uh obviously no one hopes that that will happen but if there's something were to turn uh how vulnerable do you think he is to events between now and election day um all, all incumbents are vulnerable to events and you don't want anything bad to happen um you know that scenario may occur typically you wouldn't be looking at a problem with the coronavirus until the weather gets uh, colder uh, in, in california at least in southern california you can get way into mid or late november before it gets it gets colder so i don't i'm quite sure the election will take place before that but yeah there could be uh some out of you know, unexpected event that, that has people really mad at, at the governor and and there may be some minor things but here's what he's got going for him. Uh, people i think generally feel today and will definitely feel as we pass labor day that they've gotten through this pandemic pretty well particularly compared to how other states have fared uh, that schools are opening that's a great relief in their in the minds of every parent and that they're, they're back at business uh and i think they'll feel things are on the upswing, not downswing. You know, people mentioned, uh, I think Andrea mentioned the, uh, the governor dining uh, at a restaurant in um, Napa Valley. Well, he apologized for that. He hasn't done it again. And that was a year ago from when the election took place. The public is going to be more focused on what's going to happen in the next three months, six months, year ahead of them. And I think they'll see the state is on an upswing, not a downswing, and vote, uh, vote for Newsom. Um, are there, you know, obviously every action that Newsom has taken uh, during COVID, or at least in recent months, has been uh, sort of analyzed against the backdrop of a possible recall. And there are some people who criticize him for uh, having acted very swiftly to close down things early uh, in response to the virus, that he may have moved too quickly in some respects to reopen in response to the threat of a recall. I guess I have two questions about that. One is whether you agree with that, and then second, whether you agree with that or not, whether there's risk to, in the in the face of something like a recall action, acting in ways that are overly responsive to that uh, and that are anticipating the political fallout in ways that might not be, that a governor might not act if there weren't the threat of a recall, and that might be better for California. Well, first let me say, Nobody in my lifetime has been dealt a more difficult hand than Governor Newsom. Uh, the pandemic required governors, uh, their public health officials working with the CDC to take draconian steps to try and stop the spread of coronavirus. And there were some fits and starts before they got it right. They, they didn't do it perfectly. But there's no playbook. There's no precedent you can look to. There's nobody alive. And uh, they can tell you what happened and give you some guidance from 1918. Uh, so given all those uncertainties, I think he did a fantastic job. Uh, we have, by any measurement today, we're better off than virtually every other state. And there's massive amounts of money that will be flowing to small businesses to help resuscitate them, to help renters that couldn't make their payments and cannot make the full payment to the landlord, to help ma and pa landlords, of which in like San Diego, it's almost, it's over 50%. So a lot of this, I'd say the average is well over 35% of this state, they'll get financial assistance. Uh, so all these things are gonna transpire before the election. Uh, and I think um, they're gonna, they're going to all auger in favor of Gavin Newsom. Now, finally, let me say this. There was a cartoon in the LA Times, Jim, during my <laughs> week. I, I didn't do it. <laughs> and there were two women in the Pacific Ocean, and the water was up to their ankles. And one turned to the other and says, boy, the water is really cold today. And the other says, yeah, that's another thing I blame Gray Davis for. <laughs> so you're going to get blamed uh, uh, when you're governor. Whether you did something or didn't do something, if people don't like it, you're going to get blamed. But on the other hand, he has all these other things working for him, pandemic easing, money flowing to help businesses, money flowing to help uh, renters, uh, lots of other things that make people feel that uh, life is going to get better in the future. You know, there was a, uh, a graphic uh, slash story in the Times uh, the other day that pointed out some of the, some of the ways that California has changed demographically between your recall and this one. Uh, much more liberal state, much more democratic, 
uh, higher presence of Latinos voting, lots of demographics that all together seem to create a much easier environment for Newsom to run in than you ran in. Um, and I read that and, and noted it and, and would be curious your thoughts on that. Um, at the same time, it made me wonder whether this may intensify the interest in recalls uh, by by Republicans, uh, because it may create an environment in which a recall really seems like the only way uh, for a Republican to secure the governorship uh, in an electorate that just seems unreceptive otherwise to Republicans. So I'm curious your thoughts on that uh, in both directions. Does this does this make it easier for Newsom, and does this also possibly make it more does it uh, create an incentive for Republicans to pursue this uh, vehicle more frequently? Uh, well, just to put that in context, when I ran in 2003, um, the registration of both parties was about the same. Um, starting in 2014, it started to tilt more and more Democratic. So now the Republican Party is the third party. It's Democrats, independents, uh, Republicans. Uh, starting about 2004, this gap widened. Today, it's about 8.5 million registered Democrats, 4.7 million uh, registered Republicans. So that's 3.8 million Democrats that didn't exist for me. And yeah. he'll, you know, at least 70% of that vote. Independents are a big block. They don't tilt strongly one way or another, but they tilt slightly 2, 3, 4% towards Democrats. So there's a lot more people who are inclined on the natural to support a Democrat than there were back in 2003. And that's that's a big, a big aid to uh, Newsom. Um, do I think the people, do I think people will look at recalls more and more frequently? Well, as I think Andrea mentioned, or Liz, I, I didn't even know there was 68 efforts. I, I don't know if that was in the country or in California, but I know there's at least six other states and five of them, the Republicans are trying to recall a governor. In, in Alaska, the Democrats are trying to recall a governor. So recall is going to be a more common phenomenon. First, as I said before, if you feel you can't win any other way, what do you have to lose? Yeah. And with, you know, remember, 1911, I don't even think we had a million people in the state in 1911. Uh, and there certainly was no Internet. So gathering signatures was a big deal. Now, with the Internet, uh, it, it's social media. It's a lot easier. So re reaching those signature thresholds, which are a percentage of the last gubernatorial vote, that's the test for recall, is a subsequent recall. Uh, those are easier and easier to reach. So yes, you'll see more recalls, but I do think people are people are pretty smart and they'll they'll get onto this quickly if they haven't already. Okay, I'm open for the possibility of a recall, but are things going well for me or not? Is my family doing better or not? So that's that was the classic test with Reagan. I think that's still best, basically the test today. If your life is doing better, you're likely to be more positive toward the public health officers, and in this case, the governor, who played a role in that in that uh, uh, factor. Do you think there's any chance that, along the lines that that Bustamante played in your role in your campaign, that there would be any prominent Democrat who would emerge as a candidate in this recall? I certainly hope not, and I've made my view on that very clear. I mean, I could speak to this in a way that almost no one else can. I mean, it really hurt me that the lieutenant governor was running against me. Did he have a right? Yes, he had a right. But uh, does anyone have a right to run against the governor? They do. But a better, fair way to become governor is to run in a normal election where there's plenty of time to bet you. You have plenty of time to explain your the reasons why people should vote for you. Uh, and we'll know in June who the two candidates are for uh, um, November. This is a total crapshoot. You don't, uh, you know, the two most prominent candidates are John Cox and uh, Kevin Faulkner. Uh, I, I noticed uh, that Angeline is running again. I, when I was <laughs> in office, I was, I, we lived in West Hollywood. At the first, actually, the Doheny Drive, and we were the first block south of, uh, San, of um, Sunset right where the Sunset Strip starts. Um, and she had a big poster right there uh, all the time, not just for the uh, campaign. <laughs> and Larry Flint, who was published of the uh, Hustler, he, he, he was in there. So, I mean, all these people, Gary Coleman, all these people, characters in there. I mean, it was like a circus. I mean, CNN had a theme song, a theme song just for the California recall. Uh, 
we don't seem to have the, the, that kind of vibrant personality so far, but we won't know for sure. I think what happens is when the Secretary of State says, okay, everything is in order, then there's like a 24 hour period, another anomaly, where everyone has to file. I mean, you, I'm sure they just have it on their computer, they're ready to hit the button, but you have to file within 24 hours and then Lieutenant Governor calls the election. So uh, there's in many ways this recall process could be improved. But I think the best way to do it is just have one standard uh, for everyone involved, one election, and whoever wins gets to serve the remainder of the governor's term. Last thing I'll ask you, and then I will turn it over to Jessica and to audience questions. Uh, that's one reform you've already uh, mentioned is a possibility. Uh, they just one election, the winner take all. Um, what about uh, the signature requirements? Is there any room to address that? It does seem, uh, as you've mentioned now a couple of times, um, uh, painfully easy uh, to qualify a recall for for such a serious uh, mechanism. Uh, it, I guess my two questions are: Would there be a way to amend the signature threshold, and is that desirable? Uh, should we, if we could? I'm not sure if uh, I, I know there's a way uh, to amend the signatures. I'm not sure if it's advisable uh, for this reason. On, on the merits to a political science, it makes perfect sense. But again, you're taking something back from people. Um, if, if it had to be submitted to the people for a vote, I would be fine with that. And whichever way the people come down on it, um, you know, is fine with me. It's obviously a heck of a lot easier today to gather the signatures. It's roughly 12% of the vote, total vote cast for governor in the preceding election than it was back in 1911 for all the reasons we talked about before. Yeah. But again, uh, the public doesn't take kindly uh, when the state tries to take something away from them. So even if they had the right to pass it by statute, I would recommend they not do that, make it a statutory initiative, put it on the ballot and and um, make their case for it and then see what the public say. Then if the public says fine, then at least you have them behind you as opposed yeah. to resenting the fact that you were chipping away at their power. Excellent. Well, all right. I'm going to step back here for a moment now uh, and turn it over to Jessica, who will forward you some questions from the audience. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Jim. Great Thank to you. be with you. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Um, as Jim mentioned, if you'd like to ask Governor Davis a question, there is a control panel on the right-hand side, so you can send in your question there. But we have a lot coming in already, so I'll get right to it. There has been a lot of talk about populism, but I don't know its definition. One might think that it means government by the people, but that's just democracy. It must be something more specific, but what? As I said earlier, California was a very early adoptive, uh, adopter to uh, what would be considered radical populism today, that even though your elected officials passed a law, you could undo it. And even though you elected someone to serve in office, you could you know, jerk them out of office, uh, be it a he or she. Um, I suppose the next step is just to have the public vote on everything, you know, not have a legislature, just to, but I think that's not practical. So you'd have to, you'd have to come up with some uh, situations in, in between uh, where they would occasionally weigh in on issues. I, I think we have it about right. We have elections every two years on the natural. If there are special elections because the governor or the legislature feels there has to be something on the ballot before the next election, that happens now. Uh, if you get enough signatures, there's a special election. You know, I'm open to any suggestions people have, uh, but I do think people should understand in the West in general, uh, the public is more suspect of state power than in the East. Uh, the original 13 counties, um, other states located in the East, they have all found kind of a way to get along with another, with one another. They work closely with the uh, uh, Congress and the Senate, and generally on major matters, uh, can work their will. California and the West have not been as uh, successful for a number of reasons. And I always say the reason we are innovation hub of America is that we we got tired of losing the, the, the game in Washington. So we decided we invent our own iPhones, our own apps, our own new world. And that can change many of the rules that, that the uh, uh, they're trying to be adopted in Washington. So w we generally are suspect of power. That's why we're not, we're, I think the public would be reluctant to give any of it back uh, from what they currently uh, have. 
Um, I'm not sure what, again, the new populist world looks like, um, but I do think we have to look at the positive as well as the negative. The positive are we're the most creative, innovative, welcoming people. I mean, Elon Musk, so maybe he's got a few people working in Texas and maybe even moves most of his people to Texas. This one immigrant from South Africa has revitalized the uh, um, electric car industry and it employs 10,000 people in Fremont and that plant was shut down until he came there, no workers. And SpaceX, which is the only way you can now ferry an American astronaut to the International Space Station before SpaceX was authorized, which of course is in Hawthorne, California and started by Elon Musk. Before that, we would have to pay the Russians to allow our astronauts to hitch a ride on one of their uh, Russian launch vehicles. So, I mean, he's put us back in space. He's made the most elegant and most attractive electric car to date. And, you know, does he have all kind of rough edges? I heard a podcast. He says, well, look, at, I, I have certain diseases and I say things too quickly. But, you know, do you think if I can invent the electric car and, and get us back into space, I'm just going to be a normal guy? So he's not... <laughs> And it is very it requires some care and feeding, but he does great things. So we are welcoming to people from all over the world, whether they want to make a contribution economically to our culture, uh, to our society, and that's what makes it special. When you travel overseas, people can have a real beef with America, but when you tell them you're from California, they they start to smile. They've seen the movies, they've heard the music, they know we're we're more welcoming, more open. We're a special place, and we're a special place in part because. We weren't successful at playing the Washington game, but our failure there has led us to lead the world in um, life sciences and technology. And I think it's going to, I give a nod to uh, Cambridge and Massachusetts, maybe a smaller nod to the uh, North Carolina Triangle, but mostly California is going to lead America uh, for the next hundred years in terms of innovation and new ideas uh, and new paradigms. And every every country needs great thinkers, people that are welcome, uh, folks with great ideas. Some seem crazy in the first place, and some turn out to be crazy, but some kind of turn out to be great. Thank you. Why do you call the recall a populist move? I didn't call that. That's how you named this program. Nobody can. <laughs> Fair and enough. No, it, <laughs> but it, but it has the seeds of populism in them because in many states you cannot recall an elected official. In some states, you cannot rescind a law they pass. And in some states, you cannot put an idea on the ballot that if it passes, becomes a law. So in 1911, we were arguably the first, probably the first in the country to do it. Um, so that's why I say we're early adopters of populism, but I, I have no, I had nothing to do with the title. I don't know if recall populists or not. We'll find out. We'll find out how many people vote, and um, we'll find out whether. Uh, my guess is Gavin Newsom has to get 50 percent. My guess is he'll get somewhere between 56 and 59 percent. My guess is there will be a a good turnout. Uh, it's going to be hard to duplicate what Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger was a uh, global celebrity action uh, hero. Uh, campaigning around the world to promote Terminator 2, which opened in July. He announced his candidacy in August. The election was October 6th. We had a 64% turnout. Uh, I'd be surprised if that turnout in 2021 gets up to 62%. Can I suggest, uh, if you don't mind, Andy, my, do you want to add something? Uh, I, I, just to say that in terms of populism and the recalls, the one way I might suggest thinking about this is that it's a populist or progressive era mechanism that may have been hijacked by non-populist interests, by special interests now. So maybe maybe that helps reconcile the title of the content here. <clears throat> yeah, well, for Did sure, the, the clarification? consultants, Democrat and Republican, they just want to get paid. Otherwise, they have to charge their, their, their clients a lot more in even numbered years to pay for the fact that they don't make much money in odd numbered years. Thank you. One circumstance in common between the two recalls is that Democrats have nearly full control of statewide elected government. Can you comment on how this affects recall dynamics, both inter and intra party politics? 
So let me just share my experience. When I got elected in 1998, there were 52 Congress people. 27 were Democrat, 25 were Republican. Today, uh, I think it's 42 Democrat, 11 Republican. I may be off one or two, but it's pretty dramatic change. So in my day, you had to get a two thirds vote to pass the legislation. You had to work with the Republican party. And I think that's a good thing to work with, with both the parties and to try and get a bipartisan vote because any law that you pass is likely to last a lot longer if it has a significant number of Republican votes. I mean, it's just, it's, it's seen as more acceptable um, and less likely to be something the voters would subsequently repeal if maybe 20, 30 percent of the votes come from the Republican Party and the rest from the Democratic Party. If it's a straight Democratic vote, then it's more liable to be uh, recalled or tinkered with or substantially amended in the future if you ever get a different kind of legislature or a different kind of government. And again, we're in a phase where the state has been moving left pretty rapidly, but I can tell you until 1992, no Democratic candidate for president, no Democratic nominee for president ever carried California. John Kennedy lost to Nixon. Uh, Jimmy Carter lost to Ford. Uh, Reagan, obviously, uh, uh, there was not another example of that until Kamala Harris. Well, in 1992, 1992, Bill Clinton, for the first time, won California and, and won the election. But before that, every Democratic no nominee for president, even if they got elected president, did not carry California. So all this change is at most 30 years old. And if the legislature screws things up, if they overstep, if they reach too far, then the public will, will correct. There were five, five initiatives on the ballot in 1998, most of them put on by the legislature, and all five lost. So that ought to be a signal that they're not in total step with the electorate. Now, the electorate is not just Democrat. It's an independents and Republicans and Democrats. Thank you. To what do you attribute the recall effort zeal towards city council members, the district attorney, and others? Political consultants looking for work. <laughs> Period. Full stop. All right. That's a fair, fair answer. Is your optimism about Governor Newsom surviving that, the recall? That, that doesn't mean they won't be successful. I'm not taking a side on them, but I'm just saying political consultants are not stupid. They can see this may be a little bit of a cottage industry for them. So they're looking for everyone they can they can recall. And some will fail, some will succeed, but obviously it will um, cause the person who's the subject of a recall to have to spend some of their time and energy worrying about that campaign as well as discharging the jobs, the duties of the job they were elected to. Thank you. Is your optimism about Governor Newsom surviving the recall tempered by any concerns about the possible fallout for wildfires and or drought? Um, I want to give the governor a very hard mark on droughts, I mean, on uh, wildfires, and I'm going to tell you why. So until about four years ago, we did not as a state have the capacity to fight a wildfire, uh, wildfire at night. We didn't have an aircraft that could drop chemical retardants or water, much less have these infrared cameras that we now have. And I've worked as a volunteer with two professors, then working for Scripps in UC San Diego, who came up with, a wild, with, with cameras that do not, that continue to function uh, during a wildfire and send the picture directly to every fire chief affected by the fire so they can see on their iPhone. In the past, it, the fire chiefs would have to depend on third-hand reports from firemen seeing the fire and orally reporting, but now they can see it uh, for themselves. And what is that difference does that make? So in San Diego in 2003, there was a bad fire in an area, 13 people were killed. The fire started to break out in that same area uh, in 19, December 2017, just after they put in 17 of these cameras. The fire chief recognized the problem, said every truck he had, every truck he had in the whole county, the fire got put out in 55 minutes. Those 17 are now 800 cameras are up and down the state, largely because I was able to introduce these uh, academics to, to Edison, but Governor Newsom introduced them to PG&E, and Governor Newsom uh, 
became the biggest advocate of these cameras and they have had phenomenal results in reducing fires. Now, we still have problems because the fires take place in Sonoma, Napa, up north. They take place in Bel Air and places, uh, Montecito, where there's one road in, one road out, very hard to evacuate, very hard to get firefighting equipment in there. There are other issues besides cameras, but we've got more equipment. We've got uh, 12 new planes that now fly at night, new helicopters that fly at night, they all have the cameras. So the equipment we have is much better than it used to be. Plus, he's spending a lot of time and money paring back uh, um, vegetation because you know vegetation sometimes grows and it hits a power line, that's the cost of the, of the fire. So everything he can do as a governor, uh, he has done light years more than any of the rest of us who preceded us. Now on drought, uh, drought is a toughie because in Southern California, first of all, I used to say, they used to ask me, what does it take to become a good governor? I'd say two things, rain in the North and a strong economy. <laughs> so we in the South depend on rain in the North, and this is not gonna be a good year. About half, of the, about half of the people living from LA County to the Mexican border depend on two sources of, of water in roughly equal amounts from the, I Sierras in the north and the Colorado River. It's just an article today in the, uh, the B BBC that the Colorado River is at a record low. We know that the snowfall is low in Northern California. So obviously they're gonna use mitigation measures. I'm sure they'll start thinking again about building desalinization plants. But I think the real answer, and they've been doing this in Orange County, believe it or not, for almost a decade, is recycling water. So right now, um, there's about a three-step process that uh, water gets recycled for all, all use except potable use, which is used by human beings. But there's there's two other steps they use in Orange County. One is ultralight, uh, exposure to ultralight, and then the water goes back into the ground for a year. So they drink that as portable water. And uh, we have to remember, we recycle everything that goes into plastic. God knows what's in, this is paper. My wife makes me drink paper water. But normally people use plastic. That's recycled something. That might be a recycled tire. That may be, who knows what that is. So we've got to get comfortable with the notion you, you can safely recycle water. I remember the one of the longstanding women on 60 Minutes came out to Orange County about five years ago and did, did a piece for 60 Minutes and she drank the water. This is water's fantastic. So that's, but they're the only jurisdiction doing it. So we have to look into that because um, desalinization, you have problems with disturbing the fish. It's very energy intensive. Yes, it works, but it's very pricey. That plus um, recycling, I think are the best tools we can have um, to fight a drought. Cause you can only store so much water for so long and you draw it down uh, one year, two years, by the time you get into the third year, uh, you really got to be looking at recycling and uh, conservation and desalinization. Those are your only options. Thank you. So we, we are in Southern California, a semi-desert. That's why we have very great weather. And that's why in the summer, late summer, we're in the east to south. It's still pretty warm at night. It cools off at night here because we don't have a lot of humidity. That's the good side of a semi-desert. The bad side is we don't have much water and we're expanded on other places. Colorado water, a lot of people have their straw in that water, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, Nevada, before we get it. Uh, Northern California, we've got to ship all that stuff down. It's the most energy intensive thing we do in the state is to get that water over the batteries. So we've got to be looking at more local solutions, recycling, desalinization, conservation. Thank you. There is a serious problem with homeless people camping in public areas, resulting in safety and other problems. Many of them suffer from mental illness and refuse treatment. What do you think about changing the law about mandatory treatment for seriously mentally ill? Okay, this is a very big challenge. And I predict that once the uh, coronavirus pandemic passes from the public consciousness, and that will happen at some point before the end of the year, that people all of a sudden look at homelessness and be really quite alarmed. The, we are all God's children. And the first thing we have to do is see if there's a way we can help people get better. Um, but to do that, you need to be able to find places for them to go. 
this county and the city have raised quite a, in Southern California, LA city and county, really quite a bit of money uh, that's being used in part for this room key program that's used at motels and hotels. That's a very good idea for six or seven months. They then have to have wraparound services. I signed the first bill in America, wraparound services with then Daryl Steinberg, then an assembly member, now the mayor of, Sandy, of uh, Sacramento, which requires mental illness, social services, visit the mentally ill person, not expecting the mentally ill person to find a way to navigate the labyrinth of agencies that are supposed to serve them. That's a very successful program. So find a place that's comfortable for homeless to go, um, ensure their wraparound services, and I'm sure a judge will approve you moving people from one spot to another. Now, that having been said, we can't uh, just do nothing and allow our public spaces, our beaches, our parks, places that enrich our lives to just be an encampment for the homeless. So first we have to act from our heart and from our sense of humanity to do the right thing for the homeless, but we can do that quickly because there are trailers that generals and admirals use. There's are 80, 90,000 uh, dollars a year to purchase as opposed to five to 600,000 to build them permanent housing. Tents that are segregated, the generals use them. They have all kinds of facilities, cooking, sanitation, everything. Uh, again, cheaper room key motels. Get people into a place that's safe, wraparound services, and then a judge will allow you to move them. But all that can be happening kind of simultaneously because we've got a lot of motels available uh, and a lot of trainers available. So if we just increase the mix of places we can put homeless in the short term, I mean, three to six months, um, and make sure there's wraparound services, we can start um, getting the homeless to, to leave our public parks, uh, you know, the boardwalk in Venice and other places that, that enrich our lives and are part of the California experience. So we just can't do nothing. And I, I guess my short answer is uh, the decisions that have made, been made to date at all levels of government, local, uh, regional, and state, have not risen to the moment. They have not risen to the severity of the homeless problem. And once the pandemic, think of the pandemic as the marine layer. Once the marine layer burns off, there'll be a white light of publicity on the homelessness. And I think a lot of restlessness and alarm, to put it politely, on the part of the public. Well, thank you, Governor Davis, so much. Um, I know we're at the end of the hour, so I'm going to turn this back over to you, Jim. Uh, Governor Davis, come see us in Southern California soon. Uh, well, I live in Southern California, as you can probably do. Okay. <laughs> particularly for getting me on WebEx, which I consider a technological achievement for someone of my age. And, Anytime. And, you have my number now. <laughs> well, listen, uh, I guess I get to have the last word here. Uh, I want to say thank you to uh, Writer's Block, to, to uh, the World Address Council, Town Hall, uh, but especially uh, to you, Governor, uh, both for participating today, but more importantly, for your just lifetime of service and dedication to California. We're all very grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. It's great to be with you. Thank you, Governor. Again, it's just so wonderful to see you. We have to have you back and talk about conservation with water. Jim, thank you so much for moderating today. Take care. For our viewers, please, um, we have a uh, websites for both Writer's Block and the World Affairs Council Town Hall right after this program. We provide these live streams for free as a public service. Please go to our websites and support us with these great programs. Thank you so much for joining us and a big thank you to Andrea Grossman, president of Writer's Block, who made today's program possible. Everybody take care. See you soon. <laughs>